Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Gary Chop. We're going to go into your career now and actually okay. talk, talk about some of those uh, prominent roles that you've played over the uh, your career so far and talk about okay. what's next in the life of Gary Chalk. Okay. Um, so we talked about the 80s and how The Fly was really the catalyst of the spark of getting some major roles and some great yeah. TV shows like 21 uh, Jump Street, um, mm-hmm. MacGyver. But... You also, in the 90s, sparked a voice acting career that is unparalleled to many others who have come uh, before you and after you. You were on shows like Street Sharks, Mega Man, Exo Squad, Double Dragon. I'm just reading off Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, Bucky O'Hara, Captain and the Game Master. Looking at that time in your life, are you shocked that you were able to be on so many staples of kids uh, TV lives in the early nineties and even into the late nineties? Uh, yes. I, uh, <laughs> you know, here's the funny thing. When I look back on it, I go, Holy crap. Did I do all that? <laughs> Did I do all this stuff? I don't know. I don't, I can't believe it. It's like, it amazes me. But when you're in it, when you're doing it, you're just going, oh, okay, what are we doing? I'm doing this. Like uh, when I got the, tra- the, I'll give you an example, the Transformers. Now, I did some commercials for, you know, the voiceover for commercials for Transformers Generation 2 way back when. Yeah. But I didn't think anything. I was just a, just a toy. I had no idea about Transformers, the cartoon. I never watched it. Because I was a, a grown up, you know, I didn't need to watch cartoons. I never watched cartoons. So they had a call in to go and read for this show called called uh, Beast Wars. And I went and auditioned. I thought, oh, okay, Beast Wars, cool. All right. So I went in and auditioned, and I was auditioning for Meg- uh, Megatron and Optimus. But Megatron was my big one. So I uh, I read for it and they kept winnowing it down and down. Oh, speak of that, speak of uh, Richard Schiff is on CNN right now talking to with his wife, talking about his hospitalization in Vancouver, going yay for medical, medical, you know, national medical health, national health, or as Republicans down the states would call it, socialism, yeah. socialism. <laughs> yes, yes. Anyway, so. I, I so I read for it and then they, and then and they winnowed it down and winnowed it down, and um, I remember the the director going, "Okay, can you make him this? Can you do this?" And I went, "Yeah." So I did that, did this, did that, and uh, they said, "Okay." And then I found I got the part. And I went, "Oh, cool! All right. Well, when do we start next week?" Excellent. And I got the part of Optimus, and David K got the part of of uh, Megatron. Is he originally auditioned for Optimus as well? Yeah. Like you guys literally swapped roles. Swapped roles. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Anyway, so here I am. I'm reading it and I, and I don't even think about it. I don't think I just, you know, it's going to be a cool cartoon. And then when they showed us the first episode, because it was like, you know, one of the first um, CGI cartoons, right? For a broadcast. And I went, wow, this is really, really cool. Oh, I'm glad I'm part of this. This is an excellent looking show. And I went, okay, cool, great. Didn't think anything of it. The show aired and blah, blah, blah. And I'm moving on to another show. And then I got an an invitation to go to a Transformers convention in California. And they said, we'd love to have you come in and and be at our convention. So what will I do there? It's just, oh, no, we're just talking. You know, meet some fans and go on the panels and maybe sign some autographs. And I said, oh, okay, well, that sounds like fun. Okay, so I did that. And I went down to 
down to, to California, to Anaheim, to this, this convention. And I was going to the convention hall, and uh, the guy who ran the thing, I can't remember his name, Colin, I think, he goes, he goes, okay, come on with me. And we walk into this auditorium, and it's filled with people. Like, there's, you know, at least 1,000 or 2,000 people in this auditorium. And there's a table with some girls sitting at it over here. And he goes, hey, gang, this is, this is Optimus. And you remember the scene in, in Galaxy Quest where the girls go, Eah! Yep. <laughs> well, those girls went, Eah! Like this. So I went, okay, that's great. Cool. And then, we, so we were standing there at the side of the hall, and, um, and then he got up on the stage and he introduced me and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, some of the other actors, Venus, and, uh, and I can't remember who else was there, but there were several of us who went to this convention. And he, he introduced us and brought us on stage, and the place went insane. It just went crazy, and I'm going, what the hell is this? You know, and I went, oh, oh, these are fans. <laughs> So I thought, oh, no, that's kind of interesting. So I did that. And then signing autographs and people said, oh, you, this is the greatest thing. This is an amazing thing. And, this, and, and, and I thought, okay, that's cool. Then I went to several more conventions. And people said, you've changed my life. You've made me get through my childhood, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, okay, that's no fair. Now I have a responsibility. Now I have to be a good guy. <laughs> well, I, I want to talk about that a little bit here because – Beast Wars came out, Transformers Beast Wars came out about 10 years after the last 1980s version of the Transformers. Yeah. And there is a big fandom in Transformers that if you screw it up, you will get chastised by the fans. That's right. As, as the main voice, as Optimal, Optimus Primal, and yeah. you are the lead, let's put it this, you and Megatron are the leads. Yeah. You guys have big shoes to fill from the 1980s version of the show. Right. Did that weigh on you at all? Or because it was a different version of Optimus Prime, you went, eh, I'm okay. I'm going to make it my own. I'm going to do it the way the crew and the director wants me to do it. To tell you the truth, I really didn't know uh, that I'd have to follow uh, Peter Cullen's lead on this. I, because the character was a living, breathing mammal, I didn't want to make him a robot. I wanted to make him a living, breathing um, individual who turns into a robot or becomes a sort of a hybrid robot. And um, so I didn't think of it. And also I didn't realize then that I had this huge weight to carry on my shoulders because if I did, I'd probably be a lot more nervous and a lot more, uh, I'd be a lot more um, aware of my shortcomings or I try to edit it to make it, you know, to make it pleasant to everybody else. Instead, I just, I just barreled full force ahead and said, okay, well, this is the character. This is the voice I'm going to play. They like it. Uh, the producers like it and um, I'm going to do it. But it turned out I was lucky because it turned out because the fans loved it. The, the, I tried to bring um, uh, humanity and humor and, uh, you know, those kind of actors, attributes like compassion and, 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 uh, and conciliation and trying to be more understanding of the, the frailty of the human condition or the, well, the, you know, the, the bad guy's condition, because that's because no bad guy thinks they're a bad guy, you know, <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, they don't. They think they're good guys. But, um, so that's what I brought to it. And what people responded to was exactly that. Yeah. They responded to the humanity of the character and, and, the, the, the relations, the relationships between those characters on that ship were, uh, were, was a huge, a huge thing to a lot of people. You know, it's not all Michael Bay blowing up things and, 
making loud noises and for no apparent reason. But <laughs> Before we go to the next subject, I do want to give you time to talk about that story you were about to talk about, the switch roles of you auditioning oh. for Megatron. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, no, I, this, there, there was a, the, the switch roles. I wasn't aware of the switch roles, but I read for both, and we were both out for them. But in, in Sonic the Hedgehog, I originally had the character of Scratch, and Phil Hayes had the character of Grounder. And we wanted to do a kind of a, a Bud Abbott, Lou Costello, hey, yeah, Bud, kind of thing to it. Come on, Lou. You know, and, uh, and, and, and do that because they were kind of a Mutt and Jeff kind of uh, henchman for Dr. Robotnik. And so we did that. And uh, six shows in or five shows in, Mattel comes back and there's some, we don't like it. Come up with something brilliant or you're fired. Really? <laughs> and I said, really? And he says, yes, today. <laughs> <laughs> so we tried all these different voices and they're going, no, 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 not working, not working. And then I said, hey, Phil, you take Scrat and I'll take Grounder. And so I came up with this voice and said, I'm not stupid. I just locked my head for a moment. Oh, Dr. Robotnik's not going to like us very much. And he goes, ah, he's not going to like you. <laughs> you know, he said, I can't do his voice, but he did that. So we switched the voices and uh, we recorded the show. And they went back to uh, Mattel and Mattel said, we love it. We're doing those. Those are the ones. Those are the characters. And that's what we did for. Uh, f and then so we re re-recorded the four shows that, that we had done already and then proceeded to do all the other shows with me playing Grounder and, and Phil playing Scratch. And they became very popular characters. So as a voice actor, did it, it seems like you have to be as versatile as possible because an executive is going to come in at any moment and say, you're doing it wrong. Even though the director might like it, the executive yeah. might overrule the whole production and you have to follow what they want. Yes. And so you have to be very, very flexible. How do you work in that situation then? Because if you're doing your best and then the executive comes in and goes, nope, we don't want it that way. We want it some other way. Is it just get the world? concentrates the, the mind. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know, when you're, when you're up against the wall, it's fight or flight. And so let's, let's, uh, let's come up with something and you just get really creative. You start, you know, you start ramming through every, every, uh, voice, every trick you can think of to come up with the right, with the right voice. And I've, I've, there's a, a great examples of that. I mean, I remember I was, I was doing a show called war planets what was its other name? I can't remember. Uh, something about planets, war planets. And uh, I had not gotten a part, but then a few leagues, about three or four weeks after they had started recording the show, I got a call from the producer, uh, creator, producer, saying, would you come down to the office? We want you to look at a voice. And I said, okay. So I went into his office and he goes, he brings out a maquillage, which is, you know, the, a, a, a three dimensional um, clay statue of a character. They call it a maquillage. And it was for this lizard kind of character named um, Femur. That was his name, Femur. And the guy goes, give me a voice for that. And I said, what? He says, I want a voice for this guy. So give it to me right now. And I said, okay. Um, what is he like? Well, he's an evil little bastard. and uh, But he's he's a bit lecherous and a bit leery. So you'll, you you give us that voice and we'll see. And so I'm looking at the, va the face of this guy and I'm looking at it and I'm going, hey, Joe, want to play? And he goes, yeah, oh, read these lines then. So I read the lines and he says, 
No, I just want to make a deal. That's all. <laughs> and the guy goes, right, that's the voice. Okay. Right, you're doing that. You start tomorrow. And I went and I re-recorded somebody else's. Uh, they, the, 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 somebody else was playing the voice and they got fired because they couldn't come up with it. And he gave me the voice. Is and that I hard? ended up re- Huh? Is that hard to come into a show after production has already started? Someone has just been fired and you have, you have now taken the role of trying to reproduce what they've done because usually in settings of voice acting, I'm assuming you're playing off of other people sometimes. Yes, but I didn't reproduce his voice. I created a brand new voice. No, but under that set, under circumstances, you're, you're recreating a voice that... Uh, the other actors might already have a vision in their head of what they're going to sound like because they're dealing with another actor. And then you have to yeah. come in and reproduce and create a new voice. Was that hard? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it wasn't because I, because basically you envision the movie, you see the movie in your head and you, you, you can, I can hear the other people's dialogue in my head and I feed off of them. And that's what I do. And then when you actually get in the studio with them, it's it's great. It's it's easy because that's what it is. As I said before, it's all about reacting. You were in one of the most revolutionary shows, Beast Wars, first one of the first CGI shows. But this mm -hmm. was not your only uh, intro into CGI in uh, voice acting. You no. were in one of the greatest Canadian uh, shows in the '90s, Reboot. This Reboot. Was Reboot was you played. I want to make sure I get Slash, Turbo, and a few other characters. Yep. How did you How did you get this job? Because Canadian shows do not come along that often like this, like Reboot, yes. where it will become a staple, and it was the first of its type in Canada. How did you get the job? Um, was well, it the Angus? Same, <laughs> the same way I get any job I go in and I, 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 like I work very hard when I do things. I, I go through every permutation of a voice. I, I try and find whatever I can for that particular character and trying to find a new voice where to place it and so on. And when I saw this, this, this script for this show, I uh, went in and read for it, and, and when I read, I just I just looked at these two guys, and they had these little beady eyes, and they were kind of kind of going, oh yeah, well, no, these guys are just they're henchmen. They're not too bright, but uh, they they do a lot of stuff for, for Megabyte, and 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 I think that'll be fine. And I came up with this this, this voice. Oh, no, no, hold me. I, I don't feel safe around it. Be free, little one. Be free. And uh, and uh, they they liked that voice. And then and then I ended up doing Turbo. Who was that guy Turbo? And uh, uh, Cyrus. Call me Cyrus. Hello. And uh, what was the other one? Doc Fingers. I make digits. <laughs> oh, a megabyte. What are we going to do? You know, so you just you just dream them up. You come up with them. You come up with them. And these guys are the same guys that did uh, Transformers later on, and Weirdos, and War Planets later on, and later on. And um, we just developed a good relationship. And and uh, the thing was is that we could we could. Uh, uh, the cast, not me, but we as the cast, were very good at feeding off of each other and working off of each other. With Hack and Slash, those two, Phil Hayes, who was doing the part at that time, uh, Phil Hayes and myself, Fetty, we riffed off each other because he's a comedian, right? We riffed off each other and then we'd improvise lines. And so you, you watch the show and you'll see some of the script is improvised and some of it is scripted. And a lot of times they keep the scripted or they, they keep the improvised and toss the scripted. Like, you touch me up like to make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> did, did the director give you that leeway? Did the director of uh, Yeah, the, the director and creators gave us that uh, leeway. 
Because for an animated show, it, it's a little bit harder to do ad lib of lines when they're anticipating this is what the line's going to be. We we have to go in and start editing and start creating the uh, the mouth movements for these. And to give that leeway is such a huge uh, honor in some sense, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, they, they just said, yeah, go ahead, do it, you know, and, and see what happens, see what comes up. Because... What happens is we record the voices and then they draw around the voices. They animate around the voices. So um, the recording of the show takes place a lot, a long before the actual, the actual animation process begins. Um, it's actually the quickest part, but, um, but the uh, the thing with the uh, the uh, the improv is they would they would keep the they would keep what improv they kept, they would flag, you know, on the, on the editing sheet, you know, so that when the, when the animators got it, they go, Oh, they flagged this. So we're going to animate this section, you know? And, uh, <laughs> we, we had some fun on that show. There were so many in jokes in that show about, you know, with computers and, and, and like big Al, he was so slow. What? Uh, it was like an old computer, very slow, and dot matrix. They all had these these great names, and uh, uh, you I just contact with most of your fellow. Oh yeah, yeah, classmates of all your shows. Uh, pretty well. I mean, David K. I talked to last month when he was here for a little bit. Uh, talked to David. Talked to Venus a couple of days ago, and. Scott McNeil, I haven't seen for a long time. Uh, it was Phil's birthday about a week ago, so I said happy birthday to Phil. And um, who else is uh, Kathleen Barr? I haven't seen for a while, but I've, you know, about three or four months, I guess. But most of them, I I, I pretty much see on a regular basis. I had a great time uh, with Al Willows, who um, who was on uh, Beast Wars. He played Tarantulas, and. Um, him and I and a guy named Bernard and a guy named Steven, uh, we're all old timers. And uh, there's a guy named Forbes Angus. Uh, the, 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 the four of us or five of us uh, sitting around at a coffee shop <laughs> telling more stories because we're all, you know, we've all been in the business for, for decades and uh, having a good laugh and talking about some of the stuff that we did and and what's going on in the industry and what's going on in the world now. But it was uh, quite, it was quite something. It was like, you know, five guys sitting around having coffee, you know? <laughs> um, you in, in during that transition of beast wars and reboot, you also were acting in a TV series for six years as inspector Andrew. I, I, I always pronounce his name wrong. You're going to probably correct me. Paula Chuck. Paula Chuck. That's the Paula guy. Chuck. On Cold Squad, yeah. this six years on one show. This is a dream come true because you've just come off of uh, Transformers. You're yeah. now on Cold Squad. Are you feeling your groove at that time? You're saying, you know what? I'm enjoying my life now because I'm getting the roles that I'm I'm liking. I'm enjoying, and I'm continuously getting the jobs now. Yeah. Well, the um, I, I tell you, the, uh, the Cold Squad was a dream come true. Um, Cold Squad was, I, I went in and read for, for the part of Andrew Polichuk. And I thought it was just going to be a, like a one show deal, maybe two. And uh, a, a guy named Jorge Montesi was directing it. Who's this guy, a uh, director from, from Chile, who is just a real character and, and a, a tough taskmaster. And uh, he goes, yes, yes, come and read, come and read. And then I said, okay, okay, okay. So I went and read. Well, I got the part. And uh, it took me about maybe one episode or so, maybe two episodes to get in the groove of what this guy was all about. Because the first couple of episodes, was a little bit, you know, I'm not settled in the character yet. But then as the episode started to go along, I'm going, oh, now I'm in my groove and uh, Jorge turned out to be wonderful, wonderful director. And actually all of them, Gary Harvey and Pete Mitchell and all of them, they were all quite brilliant. And 
then I remember after the first year they replaced they replaced some characters in the show after the first year, and then they play replaced characters in the show after the second year. So I'm going, oh, so what's going on? What's going on? They said no, and then we had the same characters for quite a while. Then we replaced another another set, and uh, it turned out that uh, Julie Stewart and myself were. The, the longest serving cast members on Cold Squad for six years. I guess it was six years. I think I did about 70 episodes. I can't be sure. But it was quite a bit. And um, it was a show that was just made for me. It was just written for me. And I, I, I just fell into it like, you know, it, it was like an old comfortable sweater. <laughs> you know, you just... I just fell right into it. It just fit perfectly. And uh, I had the best time just so relaxed. And it really, it really uh, enhanced my career and enhanced my, my, my experience as a, as a, as a full-time working Canadian actor. I just, the, the castmates, my castmates were just fabulous. Julie Stewart, I still talk to on occasion and, and uh, she's out in Ontario and, who else was in there? Oh, um, uh, Jay Brazo and Jay and I have just finished working together on this series, and well, we had a picture in there somewhere. So but, the, uh, the question has to be asked: uh, With all the revivals out there right now, the yeah. the street legal coming back to TV, would you be interested if they ever called you up and said we, we're looking at doing Cold Squad again? We're bringing it back for a season. Would you ever be interested in it? Oh yeah, I love that show. I love that show. That's awesome. Strad Cold Squad is just it's just so much. They were I I got to tell you they were great stories. The uh, great relationships between the characters. I won a couple of uh, Gemini awards from it and did okay. And it was such a good show that Jerry Bruckheimer decided he was going to make one too called cold case in in uh, in the states and uh they they, they canceled our show <laughs> <laughs> took cold case uh but uh yeah no they they uh it was it was a show that could have run forever it was canada's number one drama and, and, uh, and it's very hard to come across those type of shows today where it's fully yeah. canadian produced are you and not saying that there isn't some out there right now, but it's not uh, as it was back in the 90s with so many shows that I remember watching. Like I said, Street Legal, Cold Case as well. And that was a little bit later in the 90s. But are yeah. you finding that Canadian content is drying up or do you still find that it's out there? It's just not as well recognized as the market down in the U.S.? Well, I think what it is, is that there are a lot of shows that are, you know, fully Canadian content, but you don't recognize them as Canadian content because they look like American content, but they're not. Yeah. Like Supernatural was, you know, I mean, it had some American actors, but most of the stuff was out of Canada. Um, the Marvel Universe, you know, uh, um, Van Helsing is Canadian, Canadian producers, Canadian this, uh, The Flash. Um, the show that I'm working on right now is fully Canadian. It's a APTN show called Tribal, and that's fully Canadian. And do you think that Canadians are, and I, we're getting into a, f a physiological uh, uh, conversation now, and I apologize if you don't want to talk about it, but do you find that Canadians are receptive to Canadian content today? As an actor, do you find that people are saying, you know what, I'm watching Tribal, I'm watching uh, uh, the CBC shows, I'm watching the ATP, a a a P T a -T -P a -P -T -N. Yeah, shows. Are you finding that, or are you finding them still looking at the American market and Canada's market is trying to catch up to that Canadian market. I feel that, you know, what is, what's happening in Canada right now is that the shows are veering towards more universal themes, mm -hmm. universal themes, not specifically Canadian themes, because it used to be, it used to be that it had to be specifically Canadian. 
you know, Canadian shows and, uh, and with Canadian place names and Canadian values and Canadian this and Canadian that. Now it's all about, it's, I, I think it's about people. It's about humans. Like I just watched this, uh, a, a, a First Nation show on CBC called The Trickster. It's called Trickster. It's actually a pretty good show. I really enjoy you know? it. <laughs> I think it's really cool. You know, they shoot it in Kitimat in, uh, in Northern BC. And uh, there's great performances in it. You know, some of the smaller roles are not so good, but the uh, the, the 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 main cast are, are really really good. They're just it's there's no surprise. I mean, there's some some uh, great actors and great writing in that show, and I, and I thought it really expressed expressed what uh, what what's going on in Canada. You know, and I thought it was uh, brilliant. And our show too, uh, uh, Tribal. Excellent show. Blackstone was an excellent show. I'm just talking about APTN right now. Yeah. But there are other shows like, um, oh, what the hell's that show called? Firefight, not Firefight. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, uh, Rookie. Uh, the, that's out of Canada. That's out of Toronto. Rookie Blue? R- uh, yeah. That, is that what it's called? Rookie Blue? Or I think so. It's a, the cop story, right? Yeah, the cop show. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's with Gregory Smith, right? The, yeah, and yeah, it's, out, it's at, out of Toronto, and that's a, there's, there are some really good Canadian shows out there that are taking off and, and doing very well. And I think what's happening is people are starting to recognize that 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 human stories, the stories of the, it's the people in the stories that that work. Like, I remember, the, you ever see the show called The Expanse? Yep. All right. <laughs> I love that show. Excellent show. But they're into the final season now. Dark Matter was a bit weird, but that's another one that's in this final season, I think. Well, I find that Canadian content is so, like, I enjoy it, right? I try to go out of my way to find new Canadian content because <laughs> it is such an underrated uh, genre that, not even genre, but it's so, such underrated. And we've seen recently, even in the last, uh, well, four or five months, that Canadian content and Canadian actors can be recognized on an international scale with a con- the comedy Shit's Creek, right? We have seen the... Huge! Zodius of Canadian content now being looked at from the Americans because Transplant, a global show, just got picked up from the States. So Canadian oh, yeah. content is there, right? Oh, yeah. And Shit's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic show. Yeah. Um, to wrap up now, because there, there, we could go on for another hour, but I, I want to be uh, con- cognizant oh, yeah. of your time. Are you your harshest critic? When you watch back old shows, old voice acting, and you hear yourself, do you go, could have done that better? Could have done that better? Or do you go, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'm not going to look back. I'm only looking forward. No, I, um, I, I've i looked at old shows, and I've, to, to be very honest, I, I've done so many, and, and I've listened to most of them. And uh, when I listen to them, I've... I, I can actually these days look at them and go, yeah, I believe that. No, that was good quality. That was good fun. Uh, what's, what was really hard for me, it took me a long time to get over, was uh, watching myself live on TV. Okay. Because I'd, I'd, be, I'd be watching the show, and I don't really watch a lot of shows, but sometimes they come on, and then I'll just have to watch them. So, <laughs> and I'm looking at them, and I'll go, lie, lie. Ooh, lie. Ooh, the hell were you thinking? <laughs> and, and the reason why is because you know what's going on inside your head at that time. You know what you were, you know, you know what you were doing, and you know that that's not you saying that. That's your character saying that. So it's a lie, and it took me years. And years to watch myself on TV with a, a, an uncritical eye, and because uh, I was my own worst critic, and I still am on certain things. I I like things to be perfect, and I try and make things perfect. But now I can watch myself on TV, and I look at myself on TV, and I go, "Oh yeah, it's good. 
Okay, I believe that. I believe that. Yep, that's, yeah, this is good. This is a good show. Do you ever watch yourself and go, why did they choose that take? <laughs> I did oh, a yes. take on take three and they chose take seven. <laughs> I did a show called uh, Two. I think it was called Two. It was a um, cannel show, uh, American show. And I was one scene, I was in the Sun Yat Sen Gardens and I'm interviewing, I was a detective or a sheriff or something, interviewing somebody. And I go to walk away. And I stub my toe on the t- side of the table. You don't see it in the in this in the show, but you see my face go like this. And I said my line and stub my toe I don't, ah, like this, and then it you know goes away. It cuts right. And I'm going, why the hell did they leave that in? Why did they use that take? Jesus Christ! It looks like a because I go at the end of the line, I go, that makes no sense, but they left it in. It was a show called Two. I'll never forget that. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I uh, sometimes wonder about that, but for the most part, I try and do, I try and do good takes every time. And that's the, the thing about it is, is that every take is a rehearsal. You know, and if you can do something better, I mean, that's an actor's nightmare. You know, you can watch yourself on, on TV or watch yourself on stage or you do a you can do a stage run of a play for 20 years and then you walk away. And on the last night you're sitting at home, you go, crap, why didn't I do that? Oh, I should have done that. You know, it's that's the nightmare. It's just, oh, I could have done that better. But. What are you going to do? You can, you can never, you can, you can, you can go on until you're blue in the face. You'll always find something that's not perfect, but that's just, that's just the, that's just the plight of acting or any artist, you know, it's like John Kimura Parker, you know, when he did his 50 minute uh, Chopin thing, which drove a lot of pianists crazy and he finished it perfectly, but missed that one note. <laughs> I missed that one note out of the 17,000 notes. I missed that one note. You know, it's always hard to, it's always hard to be a critic of yourself, right? Because you know, your flaws and you're always looking at where your flaws are. You're not looking at the perfection in that, in that case of the piano. Oh, no. no, no, no. It's easy to be a critic of yourself. <laughs> it's really hard not to be a critic of yourself. <laughs> True that. Um, <laughs> Gary, I want to thank you so much for doing this. We will, uh, I appreciate your time that you've taken out of your day to do this. It was much appreciated. I, I had an amazing time uh, and thank you once again. Hey, no worries, man. No worries. You have a, a wonderful day and uh, and uh, hope things go well for you and uh, I hope we keep this beautiful sunny weather for a little while longer. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Bye-bye.